Hello there, my fellow pure strained burglars, and welcome back to another episode on the forces of the gene stealers. Following the votes on the last episode, which was on the aberrants and the abominants, today we shall talk about a few of the so called elites. These are the killer morph, the locus, and although he is not an elite, I also decided to include the clamavus because I couldn't get to him previously. I am your host, the Grimdark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed and learn a few things about them, shall we? The first of today's topics, and probably the most unintentionally funny, is the so-called Killer Morph. To the oppressed masses of a gene stealer cult, a Killer Morph is a figure of legend a revolutionary hero battling the uncaring cruelty of any authoritarian regime. To the enemy, he is a figure of dread, a hated anarchist who seeks only to tear down the foundations of civilization. In reality, the killer morph is neither and something far more terrifying. He is a bioform created for the very specific purpose of exploiting mortal psychology a cold-blooded killer in the guise of a legendary gunfighter whose actions would inspire generations of sedition and revolution. All of that playing into the cult's agenda, of course. Smeared across the walls of countless underhive catacombs and high-rise spires is the same graffiti image of a cloaked, free-armed figure wielding a set of custom auto-stop pistols. He is pretty much Zorro. If Zoro was an alien-human hybrid who would eventually want to eat you. Which in turn kinda makes me sad because I know some of you are too young to know who Zoro is. He is always defiant in the face of the impossible. Tales can spread about this masked hero, a litany of impossible deeds and feats of supernatural martial prowess. These stories can differ from world to world, but they do retain some core of similarity. Spinning the Liberator autostops with supernatural dexterity, the Killer Moor fills the enemy with bullets, mowing down dozens of soldiers in a few moments. When faced with an armored enemy or a vehicle, the gunslinger simply spins his pistols and calmly fires once again, and in moments those targets explode in a hail of metal. Such stories might sound ridiculous, but there is a core of truth to all of them. The Killer Morph is produced from the finest genetic strains of the local population, and gifted with hypersensory powers which in turn allow him to perceive the world around him in unusually acute detail. Rapid-firing neurons in the predatory brain of the Killer Morph allows a supernatural reaction time. Thus, the enemies of the Bioform will seem to move in slow motion to it, as he will blast them off their feet with uncanny accuracy one by one. Enhanced pheromonal senses and thermoreceptive vision allow for pinpoint marksmanship even in pitch black, while a refined vestibular system provides a superhuman level of balance and coordination. These creatures are crafted to be a heroic face for the cult. Their influence upon a fractured society, a terrifying sign of the patriarch's growing mastery of the human psyche and ability to manipulate mass psychology. Everyone from a pox-faced ganger to an upper hive dandy will style themselves upon this figure, seeking his trail and in doing that falling into the embrace of the cult. Indentured workers even risk their lives to smuggle traces of lethal chemical elements out of weapon factories. They then fashion these rare elements into custom bullets, slugs of metal tipped with depleted uranium that can pierce even power armor. The crafting of these munitions often douses the maker in deadly radiation, but they willingly accept this fate, making a final pilgrimage to present these gifts to the hero of the revolution. This is the devotion that a killer morph engenders, because he is the physical embodiment of the false freedom promises by the followers of a Jinstira patriarch. The second of today's interesting elites is the so-called Locus. Stoic and extremely patient, the Locus can go from somber stillness to a blur of motion in an eye blink. The sudden eruption of violence is as startling as it is deadly. 
Just like a lictor jumping out of the shadows, the Locust makes a lightning-fast decapitating strike, their twin sabers flashing through the fog of battle to take the head of the enemy. With that kind of reaction speed, it is said they can even match an Eldar Exarch in close combat. The Locust excels in their duty as a bodyguard, whether at war or in a one-sided parlay. Even one when merely exuding the threat of violence, they can unman any foolish enough to contemplate thwarting their master's ambition. In this role as a sentinel, the Locust can stand guard for hours, physically motionless and unblinking. Their mind, though, is always on full alert, because in many ways the destiny of the cult rests upon their shoulders. Their main duty is to act as the eyes, ears and blades of a gene sect magus. At casual inspection, the Locust will seem like no more than a statue, merging with their surroundings by wearing the simple hooded robe of a monastic servant. This can be entirely unassuming often beneath the notice of the haughty dignitaries of a world or the hulking warriors that stride the battlefields of the 41st millennium. Of course, this is deliberate, because those who underestimate this vigilant guardian will only get a split of a second to realize their mistake before the blades of the locust will arc towards them. The blood of many a stealth adept or would-be headtaker has covered these artfully crafted weapons the locusts licking them clean with their long black tongue before putting them back in the scabbards. Even over-eagle cultists have met their demise on the points of the locusts' swords, for these elite bioforms are not partial to subtlety. They only know the binary divide of a trespasser and a corpse. The twin blades are far from the only weapons of the locusts though. Beneath their monastic robes they have hidden limbs tucked away small but mighty, and a long segmented tail that ends in a curling toxin spike. To witness a locust in full form is to see a shrieking, limb thrashing monster erupt from beneath the serenity of a monkish facade. Once the enemy is dead, the robes go back in place, and the locust regains their former calm in an instant. The locust also carries a rod of office which is in fact a complex neurological transmitter known as a neurotrommel rod, crafted for them and them alone by the Genesect's Magus. This tool sends out destabilizing frequencies designed to upset synapses and thought waves. When a Magus goes to, air tags, negotiate with a powerful figure, such as an Inquisitor or an Arch Cardinal of the Ecclesiarchy, a Locus is always nearby. Should the unnatural charisma of the Magus prove insufficient to achieve the cult's agenda, then the Locust will take over. They will subtly turn the handle atop the neurotrommel rod so as to increase the field of mental disruption emanating from the weapon. This can include harrowing visions, splitting migraines, or terrifying brain spasms in the minds of nearby non-cultists. Those who are wise enough to realize the source of their sudden anguish may reach for a weapon or a pistol, only to be cut down in what the Locust and the Master can claim was just self-defense. The third and final figure of today is the so-called Clamavus. To their fellow cult members, the Clamavus is a spreader of truth. They are seen as a hero who broadcasts the creed of the cult far and wide. To the enemy, they are an information assassin supreme sending audio viruses into the planetary Vox network and dismantling enemy communication. It is their mission to create an aura of fear and confusion that their kin can exploit. In their hands, even raw data can become a weapon. Each of these hackers is a fourth generation hybrid. Utilizing a custom built Vox interceptor array, the Klamava splices into the enemy broadcast signals and echo casters. This is an effective source of information for the cult war leaders, revealing the tactical dispositions and movements of the enemy. The Klamavas can also seed their own corrupting signal into the transmission, relaying dire promises of death and destruction to the enemy or spewing blasphemous propaganda across imperial channels. 
The Clamavus is blessed with a link to the Gestalt Psychic Aura or the brood mind of the cult. Unlike a Magus, a Clamavus cannot wield this power like a Psyker. Instead, they transmit the nullifying, distorting resonance of the shadow in the warp via language and vox signal. Each static hiss of the Clamavus' scrambler array is attuned to the unified consciousness of a billion indoctrinated organisms. A choir of abnormal minds howling in supplication to the hive mind itself. When overheard at close proximity, this audial virus can cause a devastating psychic overload. Any soul unlucky enough to stumble into earshot of such an intense audio signal can suffer immediate cranial rupture, their brain boiling in their skull as they are unable to contain the magnitude of the alien symphony. Tau battlesuit pilots have died in their harness, drowning in blood as their veins burst and their bodies hemorrhaged. Even space marines have fallen victim to this audio onslaught. The booming oratory of a Clamavus is as close as many cultists will ever get to hearing the holy word of the Gene Father, the Gene Stealer Patriarch. When the voice of a Clamavus echoes down across the spires and havelocks of a hive city, all those carrying the genetic legacy of the Tyranids know that the time has finally come to sunder their chains. The propagandists of the cult preach at high volume upon the battlefield. But in the years they spend in preparation for the Grand Uprising, they use far more devious methods to spread the creed. Carefully crafted data slate texts and hymnals, riddled with double meaning, are distributed among the population, to better prepare their minds for the dubious truths preached by the cult leaders. Even the Imperial Guard's Guide to Frontline Warfare, the famous Uplifting Primer, has been rewritten to serve the cult's agenda. And then, crates full of this altered text have been swapped with the proper Departamento Minotaurum shipments, paving the way for later indoctrination. Although, given the amount of nonsense written in the uplifting primer to begin with, I doubt that rewriting them can do that much damage. And that, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about these so-called gene stealer elites, or characters, however you wanna call them, for today. Did you know about the likes of the Locus or the Killer Morph prior to this video? Do you know anything more about them? Which of these three discussed today did you find most interesting and why? Feel free to share any thoughts or questions you may have on it in the comments below. If you found the episode informative or entertaining, please click the like, share, and subscribe buttons for future content. You can also click the bell notification icon to stay more up to date. Thanks a lot for watching to the end, and I wish you all a great and healthy day. The Emperor Protects.